Yeah. Looking good, man. Yeah. Looking good. How's it going? Jackson! Come on, Jackson. Let's see that form. That's great. That's really good. Dude, you're cruising. Russian. Good pace. Good arm control. Yeah, strong. Good morning, Parkview. This is Jonah and Jackson Swartz. Um, we're out here trying to get some exercise uh, while we're in staying at home. Hope you guys are doing well. It's been nice to have a little bit of time at home with family, but also miss getting to go to church and uh, fellowshipping with everybody. Yeah. How far did you guys run today? Down to Canyon Lake Park. Really? Back. Wow. A couple of miles, three miles maybe? Probably. Yeah. Nice work. Any good ways of connecting that have been happening uh, being stuck I, at home? I've been able to face on my friends sometime. And it's good to be able to talk to them. Yeah. And I feel like I've been reading uh, the Bible more and spending time with our family, praying. Awesome. And, yeah, studying the Word together more. Yeah. Being able to study um, with Bible studies with our friends um, over Zoom or anything like that. Very good. Awesome. Well, thanks, guys. Yeah. Hi, Hi Parkview. Park View. Good, Good morning! morning. Merry, Merry Christmas! We, we miss, miss you, you, the Asphalt, Harringtons, and Maxies, and Parkview family. Stay safe! Good, Good morning, morning, Parkview! Parkview. We, we miss, miss everyone. Everything. Just to let you know, Pastor David, no church for Sunday. We're just going to hug everybody. Yay! Before we sing this morning, I just want to take a quick look at Isaiah 41.10. It says this, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now, of course, we can't just take Old Testament verses and apply them to our own situation without looking at the context. But what we see in the context of this verse is a statement about who God is, about his very character. And because of that, we can apply the principles of this verse to who God still is today and how he relates to his people. As we look at the context of Isaiah 41.10, it's dated from the time when the people of Israel had been taken captive in Babylon. And as a people, they were scattered. That may seem very familiar right now. As a people of God, we are very scattered. We're even watching this right now from very... Um, from different places, from many different devices even, different platforms. So in a way, we are scattered as well. One of the things that this verse tells us is why we should not fear. And the reason for that is that God is with us. It says, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. So do not fear, for I am with you. We have that promise of God being with us. And it's all throughout the Bible. I think of David in 1 Samuel, all throughout the book of 1 Samuel, it says over and over again things like, and David prospered in everything that he did because God was with him. It was because of God's presence with him that he prospered in his way. And because of God's presence with him that he was, he was able to face things without fear. I think of Joshua where it says, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And this is part of God's character to let us know that he is with us. It goes on to say why we shouldn't be dismayed. And I love the way that NASB interprets this scripture or translates this scripture rather. It says, do not look anxiously about you, I don't know if you've been to the grocery store lately or even to a hardware store or even out taking a walk in a park, but people are very much looking anxiously about themselves. There's a lot of anxiety and people are just, they feel, it feels like people are on edge. There's a strange feeling in the world right now. And it seems counterintuitive to us to take time and set aside time to sing about God and to sing to God. 
but it gives us the answer to the question of why we shouldn't be dismayed, why we shouldn't be looking anxiously about ourselves. And the reason that this verse gives is because I am your God, it says. Be not dismayed. Do not look anxiously about yourself because I am your God. And in these days, we need more than ever to think about who our God is. We need to sing. As our drummer, uh, David Maxey, often says, this is what we've been training for. This is very much why we've been training ourselves in God's word, memorizing God's word. This is why we've been sitting under teaching, sitting under the, the correct and the proper teaching of doctrine in God's word, so that in these days we can shine as bright lights more than ever. And let's take some time now to sing with our families. I know it's awkward in your home with just a few people, but we are going to have to get over ourselves in these days. We're going to have to get past how we look, how we sound, what we think, how we feel about it, because God has commanded us to sing. So let's take some time now and let's worship the living God. Lord God, we do come before you this morning and we want to lift up praises to you. We want to sing about how you are greater than the one that is in the world, how there's no problem, no circumstance that you are not on top of. God, we want to sing about how awesome you are. And in doing so, we pray that you would realign our hearts, that you would bring us into a place of understanding you more, that you would put the rest of our world in perspective. In Jesus' name, amen.
with your light, your love endures forever. perspective on what's going on all over the world, Father. We look to you to put things in perspective for us. And we do that by declaring how great you are, how mighty you are, Father. You are mighty in our midst. You are the great healer, the great physician. You are our defender. family. Um, happy Sunday. It's fun to be able to encourage one another. We really look forward to seeing who's going to pop up on the screen each Sunday. And so um, as we thought about the things that we've been learning during this last few weeks, um, a psalm that jumped out, something that jumped out at me was Psalm 16, which the whole psalm is really encouraging and worth reading all of it. But the part I really love is verses five through six, where it says, Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. And I remember first kind of really focusing on those verses in a Bible study where we were reading about um, Israel having their land divided up and being given their boundaries. And um, it just really makes you think about your own boundary lines. And I've really been thinking about that lately, just being at home, am I content with my boundary lines to be a stay at home mom or um, be confined to our home a little bit more, that boundary of not being able to go out maybe as freely or even the boundary lines of my life. Am I able to say that the Lord has given me um, He's made the lines fall in pleasant places. And so just really focusing and being able to say that I have a delightful inheritance in the Lord helps me to kind of get outside of myself and my own fears or concerns and um, be able to reach out more to other people. And I think that's where Danny's kind of going to tie that in. Right. Um, the boundary lines and kind of a different word we use right now is actually isolation. And during this time frame, um, Proverbs 17, 17, has really spoke to me. Um, and as it says, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for a time in adversity. And right now we're, we're all facing somewhat of our own adversity. Um, each family is different, each household's different. And um, no matter what's happening outside the confines uh, of your four square walls or however the shape of your house is, um, our faith shouldn't waver, whether we're inside or outside, if we have to go to work or we're not, um, falling on hard times or we're on the top of that mountain right now, um, our faith should be the same and growing daily. And this is definitely one of those trying times of adversity. Um, being a man that likes to physically be doing things and helping in the church has definitely challenged me um, to find other ways. And um, um, along with Amanda and the rest of our family, Moses, Abigail, Julie, Naomi, um, we've been able to spend a lot of time together on Sundays, Wednesdays, um, and just throughout the week before, I mean, any time. Every day. <laughs> that's what I'm saying, in short. Um, to pray. Um, so it's kind of a challenge to be very persistent in reaching out to other church members, friends, extended family, especially extended family that may not be a believer, um, challenging them in this time frame to grow. Um, Talking to neighbors you may have not talked to before, seeing if they do need toilet paper um, or any other needs that need, may need to be filled. 
Um, but it's definitely a faith walk to boldly step out, to ask those hard questions. To, um, if you're an introvert, to step outside and ask if there is a need that needs to be filled, um, to reach out via text, Facebook, email, whatever uh, your mode is, um, to do so. And do so with a heart of, of a servant. Um, and to bring your, your, your family along with you, that way they can experience the, the full love of God um, through outreach. Um, something that may be challenging, but um, is something that definitely um, needs to be done. So again, our, our phone number, emails are all in the directory. If it's prayer you need and um, just want more to come alongside you, as uh, Mike would say, lock shields, um, that we're a family that will happily do that. Um, so please either call and talk to Amanda and myself. Um, we, we would love to share in that with you. Parkview Church, uh, I want to report to you how amazing you have given. You have, as it says here in 2 Corinthians 8, 7, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of giving also. You've excelled in this act of giving. We talked about the need of the Albanian church, how they are locked away in their homes weeks at a time, and how the pastors want to go out and get groceries. And you supplied their need to get their groceries. You didn't just give the 4,000. You gave more than 8,000. Actually, you gave three times the amount needed. So far, over $12,000 has come in to bless the Albanian church. And so uh, I, I think our father is just so pleased and he saw it fit to bless uh, our brothers and sisters in Albania through your generous giving. And so this week, we're going to, as soon as we can, and get those funds to the Albanian church so that their needs can be met. So thank you, Parkview Church. In your power and will we exist. There is nothing outside your reach. There is nothing outside your reach. Our reading this morning is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 32. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, 
and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Bring a ring, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Good morning. We find ourselves today in the 15th chapter of Luke's Gospel, which begins with these words. All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him, that is, Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were complaining. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Four different groups of people mentioned as we look at the heart of a prodigal. Tax collectors. Well, 2,000 years ago, they were the collaborators with Rome. They would gouge people with their taxes, their tolls, their tariffs. But above and beyond that, they would get a, a percentage of whatever they could get out of the people that they would collect for their own profit. The sinners, well, they were irreligious Israeli Jews. They weren't concerned with obedience to the Torah let alone the Pharisaic traditions and fastidious scribal interpretations that led to all those extra rules. Well, Luke records for us that they were approaching to listen to Jesus. Well, at the same time, the Pharisees and the scribes were complaining. And you'll recall that the Pharisees, it was a small brotherhood of Jewish laymen. They were devoted to meticulous application of the oral law. Uh, the Jewish people call it halakha. Uh, it was the sages' interpretations and writings to everyday life for all the Jewish people. And then there were the scribes. They were the teachers of the Torah, professional interpreters of Mosaic law, compiling massive 
copious rulings that became binding over every aspect of Jewish life. And they were complaining about Jesus, grumbling. What were they grumbling about? Well, this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Jesus was welcoming the tax collectors and the sinners. He looked forward to his interactions with them and to eat with them well. Again, in an honor-shame culture 2,000 years ago, to socialize with someone in that kind of context of a meal meant that you completely accepted them and everything about them. These religious leaders saw such people as outside of God's embrace and acceptance. They saw themselves as being righteous and embraced by God. They were embraced by God because they adhered to their own man-made rules and regulations and traditions. The problem with the setting of this entire chapter is simply this. The Pharisees and the scribes did not know the heart of God. Thirty years ago, I taught through this chapter, and I got it so wrong. Thirty years ago, my focus was on the lostness of the three parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son but I never took into account, at least significantly enough, the opening verses. Jesus shares three parables to explain the heart of a prodigal, to reach the hearts of prodigals. He begins with the parable of the lost sheep, verse three. And so he told them this parable, which I didn't grasp 30 years ago, but this time I did. It's all about the grumbling Pharisees and the scribes. And so Jesus is about to share these parables in an attempt to give to the religious leaders a glimpse into the heart of Almighty God. Verse 4. What man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the 99 in the open field and go after the one lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and coming home he calls his friends and neighbors together saying to them, Rejoice with me because I found my lost sheep. Jesus begins with a, a rhetorical question because he actually expects those listening, especially the the. Pharisees and the scribes to agree with him when he starts off by asking what man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one does not leave the 99 in the open field and go after the one lost the answer is they all would have did you note in in the, in the reading of these verses the concern of this seeking shepherd he wastes no time in initiating a search a long, rigorous, exhausting search until he finds it, that is, the lost sheep. Now, the shepherd in this story, as these religious leaders would have been listening to it, they would have understood the metaphor. It would have been a metaphor for the God of their forefathers, Yahweh God. Psalm 23, David wrote of God this way. Ezekiel, the prophet, wrote of God this way in the 34th chapter. But when you think about Theophilus and the readers in, in the first century world that Luke's writing to, they might have thought of Jesus, the good shepherd that John writes of in the 10th chapter. The shepherd doesn't regard one out of a hundred an acceptable loss. And so, so he goes on an all-out search. When I think about this parable, Jesus concludes... I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. The 99 righteous people, or at least those who think they are righteous, well, they're the people in verse 2, the Pharisees and the scribes. And the one lost 
sheep or one sinner who repents? Is it not the tax collectors and sinners of verse 1? You see, God is seeking out what Israel's religious authorities were despising. It causes me to, to pause, to ask myself the question, so who do I despise? Who do you despise? The point of the parabolic story? Well, he tells us in verse 7, I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven. It is the heart of heaven. Uh, a, a, an indirect way for a Jewish person to refer to God. He says there's more joy. And so what we see is that the heart of God is exuberant in unfathomable delight when a sinner is reconciled to his creator through repentance. Oh, please note that. Through repentance, Jesus says. And that was the message of John the Immerser. It's been the message of Jesus. And when I think about that, and I, th I think of the context of the first two verses, Jesus' relationship with the folks in verse 1 does not preclude that he has to enter into their sinning to relate to them or his direct challenge to them, which he must have given for them to turn away from their sinning. To reach a sinner, you don't have to enter in with the sinning. The message is for them to turn from their sinful ways. The second parable, a parable of a lost coin, verse 8. What woman who has ten silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? Again, Jesus asks a rhetorical question. And what he's attempting to do, he's attempting to draw in the Pharisees and the scribes into the story's point. And the way he does that is, is, is brilliant. He goes from a hundred to one to ten to one in the percentage, drawing them into the story. This peasant woman, he's, she's lost one of the ten drachmas. Uh, it's a Greek silver coin. It was worth about one day's wages. And even here, Jesus slips in an irony because the value of the one lost coin is the value of what it would take to buy or purchase one sheep. In the peasant's home, the floors were dirt. Typically, there might have been at best just one window for outside light, and so she lights a lamp and she sweeps the house and searches carefully. She's setting aside all the other activities in the diligence of her search. Have you ever lost your wallet or your purse? This has happened to me and to Carol. And I want to tell you that when that happens, everything comes to a standstill for me. I mean, we come to a complete stop. Uh, we retrace our steps. We, we pray. We go in the car and go back to find out where we've been until we find what's lost. That's what this woman is doing until she finds the lost coin. Verse 9, when she finds it, she calls her women friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me because I found the silver coin I lost. And once more, in this parable, the key figure enjoins all of her social network to enter into her joy of the recovery of the lost coin. Once again, Jesus drives home the point. Verse 10, For I tell you, in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. Just as joy breaks out in heaven from the heart of Yahweh God over one lost sheep, now such rejoicing envelops the entire angelic realm of God's dwelling, a celebration of delight. You see, the heart of God is the heart of heaven. The third and most famous of the three parables, the parable of the prodigals, 
verse 11. He also said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. And so the father distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all that he had, and he traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. This request by a younger son, as the Pharisees and the scribes would have been listening, it was the height of rebellion against the father. He's treating his father as if his father is already dead. They would have been shocked at this level of rebellion. So upon the request, the father willingly transfers two-thirds of the estate over to the older brother in accords with the Torah, Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 17. And then he liquidates one-third of the estate and he hands the cash over to the younger son. The younger son, he separates himself from the father. No further relationship with the father. And so the younger son, he travels to a far distant country. Uh, the language would, to, the, to the listeners would have spoken of a, of a Gentile country. And he squanders his wealth in wasteful, immoral living. Foolish living implies immorality. And what he's actually doing, he, he's using his wealth to fuel his rebellion. Verse 14. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the carob pods the pigs were eating, but no one would give him any. As is often the case with rebellion and sin, this young man's money runs out. Just as a severe famine struck. Now, the Pharisees and the scribes who are listening to this story not only were taken back, but the height of the rebellion of this younger son, they would have, they would have been in horror of that rebellion. And as soon as Jesus would have mentioned a severe famine, they would have thought, great uh, divine retribution and judgment for this younger son. Let him have it. After all, this younger brother is in the land of the Gentiles. He's working for a Gentile. He's caring for pigs, a wretched, unclean animal. He even wants to eat the, the food the pigs are eating. It would have struck them with the horror of ritual defilement before Almighty God. And these religious leaders would have been thinking, this is as low as it can get for a Jewish man. Verse 17. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hands have more than enough food and here I am dying of hunger? I'll get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired hands. So in the story, when he comes to his senses, and that's a Hebraic expression for he repented. He's making a reversal and a return to. You see, he's recognizing his sinful rebellion was against heaven. Again, an indirect reference to God himself. And so he acknowledges what it is that he has done. No self-justification. He doesn't shift the blame. He's not minimizing his sinful actions against the Father. He even goes so far in his rehearsed speech to himself that he accepts that he had legally forfeited his position and standing as the Father's son. He's accepting the consequences of his sin. He only wants to present himself as the Father's hired hand. Verse 20. So he got up. He went to his father. But while the son was 
still a long way off. His father saw him and was filled with compassion and he ran and he threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So in the story, and can't you imagine it, this father is on the lookout. Every day he searches the horizon for this rebellious son's return. And a day becomes a week, and a week becomes a month, and months become months. And when he sees him, once again, the horror that would have come to the hearts and the minds of those religious leaders, because what the father now does, he throws aside all Middle Eastern dignity and honor. He risks social humiliation by running publicly to embrace this younger son. Verse 21, the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And even as he's speaking, the father told his slaves, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him and, and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and then bring the fatted calf and slaughter it and, and let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead. He's alive again. He was lost. He's found. And so they began to celebrate. The father interrupts the son's rehearsed speech. He says, quick. He instantly restores this son. No hesitation. The grace of the father means that this son cannot earn his way back to favor. Only by a repentant return is the Father's grace unleashed upon the Son. But oh, what grace it is. The best robe, the status of birthright being restored. A ring, a symbol of authority redelegated to the son. Sandals, a sign of sonship, not a slave. All reflective of the father's heart. Verse 23. Then bring the fatted calf and slaughter it and let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. The father even selects from among his herds a pre-selected choice calf. It would have been fatted up in, in, in anticipation of some special occasion, which it now is kept in a special pen, fed wheat grain for months on end, able to feed dozens of people, he's envisioning a huge celebration. For this son that was now considered dead is alive again. In the story, even physically, as the son left, dead to the father, but now alive again, but spiritually dead, but now alive, lost is found. Verse 25. Now his older son was in the field. As he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he summoned one of the servants and asked what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him. And your father has slaughtered the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother, the older son, where is he? He's away from the father's house. He's at a distance from his father. Oh, yes, he was tending, he was laboring, he was being responsible in the work of the father's fields, which are now his fields. 
but instead of going directly to his father, he, he gains the information from one of the other servants. And so within the story, we have the strong hint at the estrangement that the older son felt towards his father. Verse 28. Then he became angry, and he didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, Look, I've been slaving many years for you. I've, I've never disobeyed your orders yet. You never gave me a young goat that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fatted calf for him? The immediate reaction of the the older brother enraged defiance. The father then goes out and he implores this older brother to join the family celebration. And again, I note what the older brother does in, in framing his faithful service to the father in the words, slaving many years for you. And then he emphasizes his moral superiority by the contrast of the younger son when he has devoured your assets with prostitutes. In fact, he can't even name his brother, this son of yours. <laughs> Who is Jesus describing in this story? This older brother's resentment makes him as much a prodigal as the younger brother. Prodigal in the negative meaning to squander recklessly, wastefully, and of course the younger son did this, but how is it that the older brother did this, squander recklessly and wastefully? He did this in his relationship with his father. He was estranged from him. His language reveals a sense of entitlement. He is serving and obeying, not out of love, but obligation. He squandered by reducing the father-son relationship to the level of enslavement. There were two prodigals under the father's roof. One was open in his defiance. The other was hidden in his defiance. Jesus concludes the story in verses 31 and 32 with these words. Son, he said to him, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. When I read these words many years later from when I first preached this chapter, it finally occurred to me that the prodigal sons of Luke chapter 15 are not the only prodigals in all three of the parabolic stories being told by Jesus. It came to me on an occasion when I sat in an auditorium and heard a very, very dear friend of mine, Dr. Warren Wiersbe, teach this chapter when he spoke of the greatest prodigal in the chapter. See, what I failed to grasp and understand is that the word prodigal, in its positive meaning, extravagant, profuse in giving, exceedingly abundant, lavish, given to luxury. Jesus shares three parables to explain the heart of a prodigal, the prodigal, to reach the hearts of prodigals. For you see, the greatest prodigal in this chapter is the father and the one telling the story. 
Jesus. It made me go back to, to look at the opening verses of this chapter. All the tax collectors and sinners and the Pharisees and the scribes. Both, all four groups were prodigals. The sinners, openly. The sinning self-righteous, more hidden. And they were all being pursued by the heart of that supreme prodigal. God the Father, through God the Son, with his incomparable grace. By the way, there is no ending to the third parable. So what was the response of the Pharisees and the scribes? We really don't know. And in fact, we really don't know the response of the tax collectors and the sinners who have a time with Jesus. Because in effect, Jesus challenges all four groups to the call of repentance. So when I think about this chapter, I think about my own life. The question comes to me as follows. To what degree is God's heart my heart? God's heart with unfathomable grace in loving concern to reach those who are sinful in a more open way or to reach those who are by outward appearances okay seemingly righteous in fact I also ask myself what kind of prodigal am I am I a prodigal that has taken on the heart of the greatest prodigal in this chapter, God the Father, through God the Son. Someone who is extravagant, profuse in giving, abundant in all manners of my life, given to not the minimum, but the maximum, of my time, of my devotion, of my affection, of my obedience to the greatest prodigal of all, God the Father, through God the Son, by the means and power of God the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I am deeply convicted today that however I saw this chapter 30 years ago was so off the mark because my focus was not on the main character of the chapter, which was you. Lord, it's my heart cry, and I pray would be the heart cry of all of those who are hearing this time together that our hearts would be governed by your heart, that we would be prodigals, not in the sense of either one of the brothers, but that we would be a prodigal likened unto you in our relationships, in our priorities, in our devotion, in our obedience. Oh, may we be like you. This is our heart's cry today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Ye verkaka adonai v'yishmereka, ye er adonai panaveleka v'yuneka, ye se adonai panaveleka v'yasimleka shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn to you with the countenance of his splendor and give you peace. 
Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you.
If you are for us, who can be against us? If you are for us,